Amen. Well, it's so good to see you today. Uh, If you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 16. We are continuing in our sermon series called The Son of God. And for the rest of 2022, we'll be teaching and preaching from the gospel of Luke. Now, if you did not bring a Bible with you today, it's okay. We have a Bible for you. If you reach under the seat in front of you and grab that Bible and turn to page 1040, you'll find Luke chapter 16. So on 1000, 1040 Luke chapter 16 and as always if you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily please take one of our Bibles home with you they don't do any good all week long sitting underneath that seat in front of you but if you will take that Bible home with you and begin to read it and begin to apply it to your life you are going to discover radical life change because God has a way of changing our lives if we're committed committed to applying his word to our lives. So take a Bible home with you, read it and apply it. Now today in the passage of scripture that we're going to take a look at out of out of all the parables that Jesus tells, this has got to be one of the most difficult ones to wrap our minds around. Uh, you have the highest likelihood of reading through this parable and looking up at the heavens and saying, I don't get this at all. I don't understand the point. Um, and that's okay. So today, as we take a look at this passage, I really want you and hope that you will be able to apply the same truth that I've been able to apply to my life. Uh, Before we get started, at our house, uh, I'm the main cook in our home. Almost daily, I cook breakfast and I cook dinner, and Christy, my wife, is responsible for packing the girls' lunches. So that's kind of the rhythm that we found that have worked for us in our lives. We get up in the morning, we have our quiet time, I start cooking breakfast, Christy starts packing lunches, getting ready, and then uh, I go home in the afternoon and cook dinner. Now, as a family of six, I cook a lot of food. We're not talking Happy Meal size food. We're talking family of six. I cook a lot and I love to be creative and invent new dishes for our kids. For instance, this past week, I introduced them to spicy baked chicken thighs, and that went very, very well. And I also introduced them to smothered pork chops in a creamy rice sauce that did not go as well at all. In fact, Every time a new dish does not go well in our house, as the girls gather around the table and they sit down for dinner, I will almost always hear one of them say, I'm not hungry. (laughs) Or they'll look at the dish and they'll say, yuck. Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you, right? You cook a meal, you get it all together, and then one of your kids, God bless them, looks at the meal and says, I'm not hungry or yuck. Now, if I would have sat down at the dinner table with my grandmother and would have said something like that, my grandmother would have hopped up. She would have cleared the table and she said, fine, go to bed hungry. You don't have to eat anything I cook. You know, my Nana, she lived during the Great Depression and she learned the value of a dollar. She also learned how to reinvent the food that she would cook. Today's fried chicken and green beans and rolls would always turn into tomorrow's uh, chicken pot pie. I mean, she was always able to take whatever we have left on the table and turn it into something different. And as much as I would like to say I do that as well, I don't. I have very good intentions about taking our leftover food and putting it in the Tupperware and wrapping it up in bags and using saran wrap and putting it in the refrigerator to use again, but I very seldom ever use the food again. It, I store it in the refrigerator and then eventually we start shuffling things around as we're looking for food, moving things around. And eventually those leftovers turn into this weird moldy liquidy like thing that eventually just gets thrown into the trash. Sometimes I feel like we waste more than we actually cook or we waste more than we actually eat. 
And if you ever have felt like that as a parent, I'm just kind of curious, if you ever feel like you waste more food than you actually eat, would you raise your hand whether you're at a restaurant? Yes, it happens, right? It, it just feels weird when it does. So in our passage of scripture today, Jesus tells a story about a man who was fired for wasting his employer's resources. Like he was literally let go because he was not spending the master's resources wisely. So we're going to read this account in Luke chapter 16 on page 1040. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what will I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtor one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If you have not yet, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Raise your hand if this parable was a little bit confusing for you as we kind of walk through it. It is, it's a little bit confusing because in parables, especially as we just walked, through Luke chapter 15, and we saw the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep, and the parable of the prodigal son. In every one of those parables, we see somebody representing God, right? And, and the, the, the parable of the lost sheep, God is the shepherd out searching for the lost sheep. And the parable of the prodigal son, God is the father waiting for the son to return. And the lost coin represents the good news of Jesus, represents our hope and forgiveness of sins. But in this parable, nobody is good. In this parable that Jesus tells, every one of the people represented, every one of the characters are bad. Nobody represents God. In this passage, it might be helpful to think as you think through this and you process it, to think of the rich man like the Godfather. Okay, uh, if a person needs a little bit of help, they go to the Godfather. If they need more olive oil for their business, they go to the Godfather. If they need more wheat for their bakery, they go to the Godfather. And the Godfather, the rich man, he doesn't just help out of the kindness of his heart. He lends money to the people who are asking, but he charges a crazy amount of interest on the loan. So he's not helping them just to be nice. He actually became rich at the, at the, uh, at the, to the negative of the people that he was loaning the money to. 
And then the Godfather can't do it alone. So he hires a manager and the manager starts wasting the Godfather's money. And when he learns that he's going to be fired, he calls everybody that owed money to the Godfather and said, hey, whatever you owe, pay back less. If you owe the Godfather 800 gallons of oil, now it's 400. If you owe 1,000 bushels of wheat, now it's less. He makes a deal with those who owe the rich man, the Godfather money, so that after he loses his job, he has a place to sleep. He has a place to stay. What the manager was essentially doing, if you're familiar with the Godfather movies at all, he was setting himself up as a Godfather. He was setting people up to owe him. He was gonna do them a favor. He was going to offer them a favor they couldn't refuse so that when he loses his job, he would have a place to live. He would be able to be taken care of. So why does the Godfather admire this manager so much? because he reminds him of himself. He's looking at the way he does business and he admires him for his shrewdness. And he says, hey, this guy is pretty sharp. That is precisely what he would have done in that situation. And it's also important to understand that this parable is not being directed at the Pharisees. Most of the parables that Jesus teaches is directed towards the Pharisees. It's directed towards those religious leaders. This one is being directed to the disciples. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've had a moment where you have surrendered your life to Jesus, you've trusted that Christ paid the price for your sin on the cross, you've had a moment where you've surrendered your life to him, you gave up your will, you invited Jesus to be your Lord and you receive forgiveness for your sins. If you've had that moment, then Jesus was telling this story to you as well. And there's something for you to learn in it. The first point that I want you to understand from this parable is that followers of Jesus are taught here to use earthly possessions to bless others temporarily and eternally. Followers of Jesus are to use earthly possessions to bless others temporarily and eternally. Let's look at verse nine in the New Living Translation. Jesus said very clearly, verse nine, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Now, don't get confused. Jesus is not teaching that we enter into our eternal home by buying forgiveness, by, by giving up our, our resources so that we can earn a spot in heaven. We know that forgiveness of sins and a relationship with God only happens through what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And you also can't buy other people's salvation, right? You can't pay enough money for somebody else to experience eternal life but you can use your possessions and you can use your resources to open a door to share the life-changing message of Jesus. You can use the stuff that God has entrusted you to bless others for all of eternity. Not only can you bless them temporarily here on this earth, but you can bless them in such a way that their lives are changed forever and you bless them into all eternity. If you choose to tip your server $100 for a $15 meal, then you begin to tell them about Jesus or invite them to church, they're more prone to listen to you because of the generosity that you've demonstrated to them. Uh, you can use your resources to bless others temporarily 
And there are ways that you can bless others eternally as well. It's using your resources from a big picture perspective. It's knowing that you're not really just trying to meet their need physically here, but you're trying to use your resources to open up a door to have an opportunity to invite them to church, to tell them about Jesus and to bless them eternally. And that means, you know, specifically, if you have a casita in the back of your house that goes unused, you can actually use that casita to bless uh, a single mom or, or bless a family without a home. You can use your spare vehicle to bless a family that's in need of transportation. You can use a portion of your business to bless others to those who could use some help. And while you're blessing them just temporarily, while you're blessing them here just for a few moments in the scope of all eternity, you can actually be used by God to bless them eternally. As you live out your faith in Jesus through giving generously of your resources, as you live out your faith in Jesus through your generosity, God is gonna use your generosity to point other people to forgiveness. God will use your generosity as an example of what it looks like for God to pour out his generosity of grace on other people. See, you can use your earthly possessions to make an eternal difference in the lives of other people. So understanding that God can use your resources to bless others, to lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, I have to ask you a question. When it comes to your possessions, when it comes to your resources, do you live with an open hand or do you live with a clutched fist? Do you live with an open hand or do you live with a clutched fist? See, the Godfather and the manager, they're both examples of people who were greedy and loved their resources more than they wanted to be generous. They loved what they had. In fact, the manager was misappropriating the, the resources of his boss. And then when he knew he was going to be let go, he started even uh, doubling down and hurt the boss more. But the rich man, the manager, well, he was just as guilty. He clung to those earthly resources as well. And that's where we get the point from Luke 16, verse 10, where Jesus said, look, if you're faithful in little things, you're going to be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. That's what we see in this illustration of this manager. He was not faithful in the little things, so he was going to be let go. Then he was not faithful in the big things either. And Jesus said, and if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? Everything that you and I have been entrusted, everything that we have received from God, it belongs to him. Do you believe that? Do you understand that? Everything that you have, even if you get up in the morning and you work hard for that shiny 2024 Chevrolet truck, that is God's possession. Everything that you own, have, belongs to God. Do you cling to it, clutching it with both fists? Or do you hold everything that you have with an open hand, looking for ways to bless others? Do you turn a blind eye to those around you who are hurting and in need? See, as a follower of Jesus, if you really desire to love your neighbor as yourself, to do to others what you would have them do to you, then you want to consider the ways that you use your resources. Here's an example. I'm part of an online community um, that, 
the community builds and teaches others how to build artificial pancreas systems. Now, I have three daughters that have type 1 diabetes, and so I'm really heavy into this online community. It's a non-FDA approved system that we have to build ourselves and manage ourselves and update it ourselves. But there's an online community that tells us how to hack the insulin pumps, how to write code and how to build the apps on the iPhones or Android phones or whatever it is. And the way that it functions is incredible. I mean, these guys that have created it are geniuses. As the girl's blood sugar starts to go up, the insulin starts to be given to them automatically. And if their blood sugar starts to drop too quickly, the insulin pump suspends itself. This is a closed looping artificial pancreas system that's not FDA approved, but these geniuses figured out how to do this and they're sharing this information with other people who want to uh, use it. Let me tell you something. It has changed our lives. I mean, it, our girls' frequency of low blood sugar is so much rarer. Their highs are so much rarer than other people that are trying to control it on their own. And these developers that have developed this, they do it for free for absolutely no charge. They're not looking to sell the program. They're not looking to get anything out of it. They spend hours developing that technology and it has blessed my family greatly. Now, how they choose to use their resources may not matter to you, but for my family, it has made an incredible difference. It's through them, our family has been blessed. Through their knowledge, we experience so much more peace and our hearts are grateful. So now in my spare time, what I do is I try to help other parents develop this loop system. I, I try to help them download the code and figure out how to build it and monitor their kids T1D so that their kiddos can live a healthier and happier life. That's because these people who set back, they may not be followers of Jesus, but they said, I'm going to use my resources to help other people people. You have resources, whether it be wisdom, whether it be knowledge, whether it be financial, whether they be physical, you have resources that you can use to bless and help other people. Will you? Will you cling to it with a closed fist or will you look at those resources that God has blessed you with, with an open hand and choose to bless the world around you? And the reason why I ask you is this, your management reflects your relationship with God. Your management of what God has entrusted to you, that reflects your relationship with God. Luke 16, 13, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. See, Jesus is teaching through this parable that the way you and I manage our resources reflects our relationship with God. See, if you're truly seeking to please God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, then everything that you have, everything that is at your disposal, you're going to use to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus is teaching here in this parable. Now, the manager and the godfather, the rich man in the parable, they were unfaithful with what God had entrusted to them. And I don't want you and I don't want me to live my life in an unfaithful way. However, God has blessed you and I, whatever that looks like. And I'm not just talking about finances. I'm talking about every area. God has entrusted it to you so that you can bless other people. 
it's clear that the manager had been unfaithful in the little things. And as he was unfaithful in the little things, he became unfaithful in the big things as well. He started cutting backroom deals, having uh, backroom conversations and organizing and structuring things so that he would be taken care of as opposed to his boss. And if God matters more in our lives than our possessions, people around us are going to experience God's love flowing out of our lives. See, if, if people matter more than possessions, if your relationship with God matters more than possessions, then God is going to use you to bless the world around you tremendously. You can't serve two kingdoms. You have to decide which kingdom you're going to serve, which kingdom you're going to live in. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you've already chosen to live in that kingdom of light. So live as a child of the light. And that's okay when you get hurt and you overlook the hurts, when others cause pain in your life to overlook that because you are a child of the light. Let the world be shrewd, let the world be crude, but that's not what God has called us to do. Be faithful in the little things and God is going to trust you with more responsibility. So strive to be faithful in everything. Let's pray together. Father, we do desire to be faithful in all things. We desire to be faithful with everything that you have entrusted to us. And Father, we acknowledge that we, we've wasted resources. We've wasted our time. We've wasted talents at times. Father, we've, we've wasted often. And so God, we're grateful for the grace that you've given to us. So Lord, it's our prayer that you would continue to, to pull us back to you. It's our prayer that you continue to bring us back into a right relationship with you so that as we seek your kingdom first, as we choose to bless others, other people will be blessed for all eternity because they'll see the difference in our lives. They'll see that our hope is in heaven and they'll desire that type of relationship in their life as well. So Father, use us to bless others. Thank you so much for how you change lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.